Very good afternoon. Welcome to all of you to the side events at Food and Agriculture Pavilions. We will discuss on less emission with better livestock production, climate solution for sustainable livestock transformation. Actually, today, this morning, at FAO also, we will launch the new report on lower emissions for better livestock productions, which actually you will get the full report very soon. And that's why it coincidence that this morning and this afternoon, we organize the side events in these pavilions. And I would like to welcome all of you to join us. Actually, it's my colleagues, uh, directors of uh, Office of Climate and Biodiversity is here as well, which actually perhaps I will ask you to have a short remark. Uh, uh, for all of us, since uh, our direct, uh, Deputy Director General DDG Semedo, uh, she is not here at the moment. And also first, I would like to ask His Excellency Mr. Fernando Matos, uh, Ministers of Livestock, Agriculture and Fisheries of Uruguay, to take the floor and also to have a remark. The floor is yours. Thank you, Tanawat. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to participate in this uh, speech here in the FAO pavilion. Well, um, from Uruguay, uh, the characteristics of our, our cattle production or, or livestock production is uh, mainly based in grasslands uh, without deforestation and the uh, with a very low participation in global emissions. Uh, we have uh, good practices and robust win-win evidence with challenges uh, of the region, international pressure for mitigation in sector highly affected by climate change that requires adaptation. Uh, we need to develop uh, for developed countries to meet their financing commitments for the necessary transition in developing countries. Well, um, this moment in the discussion here in, uh, in COP28 uh, is very important, this topic, to put uh, in evidence that uh, the production systems in our countries uh, are highly vulnerable and is increasing very much because uh, of the um, consequences of the climate change. We are just living in, uh, in our country, in our region, the worst drought in, in 100 years, and a very high impact um, in the economy and mainly in social consequences to the, to the people, mainly from the farmer, but also for all the, the supply chain and the very, very high, very tough situation for us. Uh, that's the point that the variability of the climate uh, is consequence of the, um, the very high um, level of uh, contribution from developed countries in CO2, no? in the carbon gas. And it's really uh, it's a very difficult situation for us because uh, and the, the global discussion what are the responsibilities from the countries? And we need to put this in evidence that the developing countries that contribute much more for the gases emissions in the atmosphere that causes the, 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 the change of climate have to assume the responsibility, the main responsibility, and have, and the, have the disponibility of resources to uh, help developed countries to um, apply some systems of resiliency and adaptation. We are uh, committed also to uh, enforce or uh, improve uh, more measures in order to diminish in our system to produce more with less. We have all the commitment from protect our natural resources also. 
to protect our our um, rivers and our lakes and our uh, water resources also. That's so important for our production. But in the same way, we have also uh, to need um, to receive more financial uh, and more fairly system for fi finan finance this kind of adaptation. For other side, we also are improving uh, more uh, research about less emission from the livestock in the genetic lines, uh, also additives in the, in the feeding from cattle also. And we are several steps in order uh, to manage grazing without uh, systems that would not require so high investment, but as we have uh, grazing and free range system of feeding, only managing the grasslands is very easy and with subdivision and uh, keeping uh, the cattle with um, the, the, the good, good way of feeding the crop of the system, production system. The challenge of the region, there is an increase in international pressure to implement transformations in a context of great vulnerability of agriculture production in the region due to climate change. The means, this means that developing countries, which are food suppliers, have to advance in adaptation to not lose production capacity and families from rural areas. At the same time, we have to invest in public goods that allow us to keep, to keep pace with market demands. So, um, the, the message final we can do, uh, that uh, we are, uh, as a region, we see with, with concern some international messages. We generalize some particular cases. When we speak about the uh, livestock production, we have several systems of production. We have not an only system. But we have to respect. We are uh, when we are we speak in some regions about um, livestock production. The, 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 you you put at the side the image of the jungle burning. It is not related with our system of production. We have to keep, and we have all the responsibility to uh, to keep the natural resources in the jungle. Uh, with in better conditions, not deforestation, and uh, we are really uh, the commitment, uh, and we can not um, receive uh, with um, with good manners uh, some messages in order um, not to reduce the consumption of uh, livestock products related with the system of production. We cannot do this kind of statement because uh, my, our opinion that there's less of responsibility to have a generalization like this. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Excellency Ministers Fernandos, uh, Fernandos uh, Mastos from Uruguay. And next, I would like to take this opportunity to invite my dear colleagues, um, Ms. Martina Otto, uh, head of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition Secretariat from UNEP. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here with the colleagues from, from FAO. Thank you for the opportunity. And, uh, well, what has brought us here uh, at COP, obviously we are facing a climate crisis. We do see progress, but uh, not, not quickly enough. And as a, a good colleague uh, put it, winning too slowly is losing. And this is where the short-lived climate pollutants do, do come in, uh, very much so, because they have a shorter lifetime in the atmosphere and have a higher global warming potential. By cutting them with targeted measures alongside the deeper transitions that we uh, that we're after, uh, that are after decarbonization, um, we can harness benefits for near-term warming. We can curb the curve of warming earlier. And 
we are talking about 45% reductions of short-lived climate pollutants by 2030 that could give us as much as 0.3 degrees by mid-century. And uh, that's a bit of the lifeboat uh, in, in all of this to be on a 1.5 degree pathway. And just to say it's a dual strategy. It's not one or the other, it's together. Now, why do I talk about short-lived climate pollutants in the agricultural sector? Um, there is burning of residues, for example, that comes with the carbon emissions. There is uh, rice production uh, that, uh, that sees methane emissions. There is livestock, and we heard a little bit of, of that as well. And, uh, and then obviously there's food loss and waste uh, with the organics sort of uh, uh, emitting methane as well. And um, you, you've seen it, I'm sure, the non-CO2 agenda, as we call it, or the short-lived climate pollutants, super pollutants, they have been really at, uh, at center stage at this, this COP with very heightened uh, tension. And uh, that's for a good reason, because uh, we look at 30% of global warming being um, uh, but caused by, by, by those at the moment. And in the agricultural sector, we see 45% of methane reductions, for example. But in line with this, it's about opportunities. And uh, I want to highlight that uh, methane is a precursor of tropospheric ozone, which impedes plant growth. So by addressing methane in a very targeted manner, we can actually save um, the uh, productivity of, uh, of crops, uh, five to seven percent, uh, for example, and that's a contribution again to food systems. There is ways of turning this into opportunity. So if you talk about burning residues or making them part of circularity and finding new outlets, that's a way forward. If we talk about uh, methane from livestock, we look at productivity gains, and I know that there will be a bit more from our colleagues from Brazil on that topic. We're working together on this. So it's not about and, and that's important to mention as well because of all the sensitivities around this. We're not talking about net zero in this case. We talk about 20 to 25% of methane reductions. And that is what we must do, but also that is what we can do with all these benefits that we've been talking about. There's technologies and solutions, practice changes that exist, alternate wet drying, for example, for rice, um, animal health and feeding, that goes along with good practices that are good for productivity as well, uh, and so on. Now, it's all about getting to to speed up and to scale up and how we do that. Uh, and here policy I want to mention and finance I want to mention. Both are really important. According to the FAO, only 20% of climate related development finance was allocated to agri-food systems in 2021. That's too little. And particularly if you look at the size of the opportunity that I pointed out in terms of emissions reductions. Um, and maybe with that, uh, I, will, I will stop and I will say the CCAC, Climate and Clean Air Coalition, is a partnership that brings together 90 almost 90 countries and over 90 non-state actors. We have put into place a support system to act on short-lived climate pollutants and particularly methane. We're at the Secretariat, we provide Secretariat functions to the Global Methane Pledge as well, and we're here to support. So please come and see me if there's any requests and hopes. And we work in this very closely together with our colleagues at the FAO. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Martina, for your uh, remark. And also, we need to take action now, action and actions. And that's why I would like to ask my colleagues, uh, directors of uh, Office of uh, Climate and Biodiversity's CAVE. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. If I look unprepared, it's because I am. He just called me in, into this about one minute ago, so, so please, please excuse me. But uh, um, really, on behalf of, of, of our Deputy Director General, who was uh, uh, meant to be here, I just wanted to, to thank you all for coming. This is the most packed side event uh, room we've had here, I think, since, since the beginning. This is clearly an issue that, that is of interest and, of course, is of paramount uh, importance. Uh, so, so let me re-welcome you, if you will, to, the, to this side event um, and thank all the, the partners and speakers who've, who've joined us. Um, livestock, of course, we, we all know, plays a crucial role in providing essential nutrition and sustaining livelihoods of, of many families and communities worldwide. Uh, but the benefits that they bring have to be weighed against the potential negative impacts on our environment. And that's why this is the perfect setting to have the conversation here at COP. 
greenhouse gas uh, emissions generated throughout the production chain of livestock contribute uh, significantly to global warming, and, and they pose a challenge that demands our, our ambition, our attention, and our collective uh, action. Uh, countries and, and livestock stakeholders realize that sustainable livestock transformation depends on a stable and resilient climate for food security, and I think His Excellency the Minister was very eloquent about that. Uh, in the face of the impacts of climate change, it is, it is critical for livestock sector to actively participate in mitigation and adaptation to climate change, the dual challenge that, that is central to our conversation here at COP. And this becomes even more pertinent when we witness a growing demand for animal products, uh, fueled by a rising global population, and of course the shifts in dietary patterns that we're all familiar with. And it's within this context that the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and the adaptation to the consequences of climate change, consequences that are already seen, of course, is, is so important. And that's why it is part of our work at FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, because we recognize this urgency, the urgency that has embedded the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions firmly within our work, uh, our members have adopted for themselves a climate change strategy, a very ambitious climate change strategy and a strategic framework, and we have an action plan to embed climate considerations across all the sectors, and that's why we have a sort of an unwavering commitment uh, to providing all the data, the knowledge, the facts, fostering the capacity building and facilitating assessments and interventions that can mitigate emissions, including within the livestock system, in particular, as Martina said, uh, addressing the methane emissions to slow global warm warming. During this year, FAO, as many of you know, because you kindly participated, convened the Global Conference on Sustainable Livestock Transformation. It was in September in, in Rome, and we held that back-to-back -back with the Global Conference on Sustainable Agricultural uh, Mechanization. Then in November, uh, we also hosted the Global Forum for Animal Feed and Feed Regulators uh, that highlighted the need to make the sector more responsive to a growing global demand for animal source foods while contributing positively to livelihoods and the environment. So it's not just at this event, it's not just this, this publication. You know, we're building, this is a it's an important conversation, it's a complex conversation, and we have put in place all of the building blocks through this year to address it with the ambition that we know uh, it requires. To achieve the transformative change and to lower the emissions, we need collaboration, we need stakeholders, we need partners, and we need investment. Again, Martina quoted an, a report that FAO uh, is, has, has published before. The new version comes out this year, and even as we're beginning to find the solutions, right, the agri-food system solutions to climate change, solutions that can bring real wins in terms of building resilience, adaptation, in terms of mitigation, and of course in terms of food security, the amount of climate finance going to these solutions is minute. And what our report shows is that the, the, the amount of finance, especially climate tagged ODA, is actually diminishing. We have solutions, we have opportunities to really reverse the trend, but the finance is not there. Um, Tanawat, we have a very long speech that, I, uh, that I'm not going to, to, to read, of, but, uh, read the rest of, but I really just wanted to say thank you for your support. We appreciate it. Thank you for your partnership. It's not a one-off. It's not just one report. It's a real process, and we appreciate your engagement uh, in that process. And, of course, this is a, a, a conversation that, that we need to continue, but not keep it only at the conversation stage. We need the investments. We need the partnerships. We need the action on the ground, including for sustainable livestock. So thank you for joining us here. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Kavei. Actually, I just uh, forwarded him the remark it just only one minute before he came here. But actually, he did a wonderful job. And that's why this time I would like to take this opportunity to invite myself to talk as well. And that's why, as you know, that during the week and also even though over uh, the past years, livestock se sector has been criticized and also we're talking about the contribution of livestock sector to greenhouse gas emission. But today we don't talk about what we are contributing, but we're going to talk about pathway toward lower emissions. What's the options? What the mitigation the livestock sector can make contribution to this healthy planet, healthy people? And that's why uh, today is very nice to see all of you and also to share with you what we have seen and what we want to do more together. 
And that's why if you want to take action, do it now. If you want to see better future tomorrow, do it now today. We don't have any time to complain and complain and complain. But we need time to take action more and more. And that's why you know that uh, some of you have seen this uh, picture before during the Global Conference on Sustainable Livestock Transformation that we are projecting by 2050. We know that the, our uh, population growth will reach almost 10 billion. And from today, we are expecting that the consumption growth will, on average, is around 20%. But in some country, will go up to 100%. This one is because of uh, economic growth and also the need of animal proteins and also uh, high quality protein of our uh, consumers. And that's why you can see that in Asia, in America, and in Africa, in terms of uh, the growth is exponential. But anyway, maybe the growth is a bit uh, stable in Europe and also in Oceania. When you're talking about the greenhouse gas emission assessment, livestock sectors emit about 6.2 gigaton or 6 billion ton of uh, carbon, as, let's say representing around 12% uh, of total uh, anthropologic uh, greenhouse gas emissions according to the baseline uh, data in 2015. When you look at the details of the greenhouse gas emission assessment in livestock sectors, 54% of the total greenhouse gas emission are in form of methane, short life uh, climate uh, pollutants. And also, and you can see from the, the pie chart in red, it's 50% uh, of uh, the methane uh, forms. And also the other 38% thir uh, uh, of the emissions are associated with upstream and downstream process from animal feed and also uh, um, and processings and others. But we know that over the past years, all the producers, farmers, and also private sectors and even the, the governments take all the measures to mitigate and also all the solutions, options, uh, mitigations has been put in place that you can see all the mitigation solution in terms of breedings, lumen and man uh, manipulation, feeding strategy, feeding management, increase the productivities, increase the efficiencies of the productions, uh, change in terms of consumption pattern is also very important, and uh, reducing uh, food and feed loss and waste in the whole uh, supply chain and also improve animal health and welfare is one of the key issues and also the uh, the role of carbon sequestration in grassland or soil uh, carbon sequestration is also one of the important role. And we know all the options, we know all, all of the mitigation options and also difference, you can see from the, the graph that uh, different uh, commodities also give a different, um, make a different contribution uh, to greenhouse gas emissions. By 2050, according to the, our assumption that uh, the increasing of the animal productions will increase by 20%. And you can see that uh, on the best, uh, best line data that we have right now, uh, livestock sectors contribute around uh, 6 gigaton. And then if we do nothing, if we do nothing, by 2050, we will increase around uh, 46 uh, percent uh, increase of greenhouse gas emissions, which actually will reach around 9.9 uh, 9 gigaton, let's say. But however, we know that we have solution, but we need to take action. You can see that all solution and all mitigations and measures is, are there. But we need to take action today if we want to see the result tomorrow by 2030, by 2040, by 2050, and we can reduce up to 1.9 gigaton only. But I'm sure that this one is not collective action, but some action and measures, if we do together, it can reduce more. And I'm sure that all of you who are here, you will bring more solution, you will bring more technology, you will bring more ideas that we can do more and reduce more. And perhaps we can go down to zero. This one is our commitment from livestock sectors. But we need to take action and bring solutions, bring technologies, and we need investment. And that's why I'm sure that all of you can bring all of this, can work together to make sure that we can bring down the emissions from livestock sectors. 
And that's why now all the work that FAO are doing right now since we are in September when we have, uh, we organized the first time ever uh, global conference on sustainable livestock. All the action is ongoing at the country level. During the month, this month, we have the regional and also national dialogue on responsible investment for sustainable livestock. And also I know that all private sectors during this week just play more action from dairy sectors, from beef sectors, and also from other sectors. And that's why we know that all of you who are producers, farmers, and also private sectors, you are the one who are helping us, who are working with us closely to make sure that we can bring down uh, the emission. And that's why the work of FAO and Arna, we are working on improvements of uh, animal health and productivities, working with the countries, and also to integrate uh, livestock-related mitigations and adaptation target down to make sure that all the policy that we talk, it really translated into action, action, and action at the ground level. We should not only talk, 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 and next year we will talk again. And we don't see the result. And that was to make sure that next year we can see that next year we see better result from this year. And that's why in terms of capacity building and knowledge transfer is one of the key and all stakeholders need to share your best expertise. And that's why one of the outcome of the Global Conference on Sustainable Livestock Transformation organized in September, we will have a sustainable livestock transformation digital platform that all stakeholder, farmer, producers and countries can share your expertise and we can learn from you, we can scale up, as some colleagues already mentioned earlier. And I'm sure that my colleagues who are going to be panelists will bring more action after this. And also in terms of uh, development of the meet, uh, national methane roadmap. And I will show you that at the global uh, level, we have a roadmap, but now we have to bring down to the national uh, activities and also to support the country in terms of the designs of low emissions and uh, climate resilience investment projects. And that's why now we are talking with uh, financial institutions, talk with uh, Jeff and also CGF and also others, financial institutions and donors. How are we going to put more investment? As I told you, all the options, solutions, measures there. But we need to invest and take action immediately from today and tomorrow. And that's why in terms of the multi-stakeholder dialogues, we will continue and FAO will work with all stakeholders in the sectors that we can bring all solution to all of you. And as I mentioned, the global um, conference on sustainable livestock transformation is not the single event because we want to continue, because we want to highlight that every two years we can showcase what we make achievement. By 2030, how much we can reduce. By 2040, how much we can reduce. And by 2050, we can do more and more together. Um, and that's why we call for actions to invest in program and implementation and, and, and projects aiming at reducing greenhouse gas emission and adapting to climate change for livestock sectors and also to scale up uh, climate solution together all the new idea, new approach, innovative approach, technologies. We need to bring it. And that's why during the week, during the month, we're talking with different uh, universities and research. And that's why even though at this pavilion, and that's why FAO working with CGIAR, working with EFAT and also Rockefellers, because we need all sector to work together. And that's why we need to build strong collaboration and partnership. And you are part of this partnership. You are part of the solution. You are part of this collaboration if we want to see result tomorrow. And also to build the capacity in terms of in institutional capacities, our producers and farmers, they need solution. They need good practices and we, they need investment. I, ju I just talked with colleagues before. Our young farmers, young producers in Africa, they ask us, what they can support them. When I talk with farmers, young farmers in Europe, they ask us, they are a solution or they are a problem. To make sure that people who are feeding us, producing food for us, don't let them ask us, they are a problem or they are a solution. But we need to work with them together to bring more solution, solution and action. And that's why in terms of parities, in terms of adaptations of all climate actions, 
I'm sure that my colleagues from Office of uh, Climate Change and Biodiversity, we need to work closely, even though in FAO and also other international organizations, to bring more solution to all of you and work with you. And that's why during the Global Conference on Sustainable Livestock Transformation, we have a roadmap at the global level, what we're going to do more through the Sustainable Livestock Transformation Initiative to build science and evidence-based narrative to advocate for sustainable livestock. We need to bring all the data, we need to bring science to showcase, to highlight what we can improve. And also to promote adaptations of the good practices, best practices that now ongoing are working and implementing at the ground level, at the country level, and also how we're going to support the policy development and increase responsible investment. And that's why we know that all of you are working on this, but we will continue. And that's why during this week, we have seen a lot of commitment, a lot of plague, but I'm sure that after this COP28, we will see action immediately and we will see uh, in terms of investment immediately and also how to integrate all the work around livestock sector together because we need a good package. We need a complete package that we can uh, bring to the country, bring to our farmers and also we need to accelerate action Action, action. Uh, in terms of innovation, I talk a lot already, but we need action. We need more action. And also, each sector, each country, we have heard a lot that now you have a, a pathway to dairy net zero. Some countries have uh, bee production sustainability. You're working, but we need to bring your, your work and also to inform to consumer, public, and also policy maker, what you make progress. And all the sectors, now you have your own sustainable pathway, you have your own su sustainability framework. But we need to showcase, we need to highlight, and even though we need to talk what you are doing. And then the key message that I would like to share with you, uh, livestock system collectively contribute to greenhouse gas emission, all of us know. But we need to make sure that all the technical and innovative solutions, we need to make sure that we can take those measures to be implemented at the ground level and also more climate finance is needed. And livestock system can be part of solution. Livestock system is a part of agri-food system. Livestock is a part of food system. And we need to contribute. But anyway, you are what you eat. You are how much you eat. You need to balance about your healthy diets. You need to have both animal source food, plant-based food. Everything is about balancing, which actually all of you know. But sometimes we forget. And that's why <laughs> to make sure that we take this into account. And that's why thank you very much for your... In, uh, and that's why you will see the full report, the pathway toward lower emission by today already and also some of the report that have been uh, published before, uh, let's say like methane emission in livestock and rice system, which was uh, published uh, during uh, the Global Conference on Sustainable Livestock Transformation in September, and also the contribution of terrestrial animal source food to healthy diets was published before. And actually this report, more than 200 million people, readers downloaded, is unbelievable. And that's why we will have more report for next year and also during uh, the FAO uh, uh, COEX subcommittee on livestock that we will organize in May next year. We will have more report and more uh, assessment uh, result regarding to uh, livestock and agri-food system, livestock and others. And thank you very much. And now I would like to call my, thank you, thank you. Uh, I think we don't have enough time to, uh, I would like to call my panelist, uh, Mr. Hayden uh, Montgomery, uh, the Agriculture uh, Program Directors of the Global Methane Hub. With us, thank you. Yeah, sit here, please. And also I have uh, Ms. Uh, Retina Miranda, the Secretary of, uh, Secretary of the Innovations, Sustainable Development, Irrigations, and also corporate, uh, Cooperative from Brazil. And also I have Mr. Eric uh, Shawaf, uh, Senior Vice President, uh, People and Nature Environmental Defense Fund.
with us. Thank you very much, uh, Eric, to join us. And also, uh, Dom Nomur, Executive Directors, uh, Global Dairy Platform. And also, Miss uh, Julia uh, Vett, uh, CN30 Project Manager, uh, Meat and Livestock Australia. And that's why I would like to start immediately. Actually, actually, I didn't plan to moderate this session, but I have to do. <laughs> Thank you for opportunity. Hayden, <laughs> uh -huh. can, can you please tell us about the new plans to accelerate solution for enteric methane mitigations and their implementation in developing countries? I know that you work a lot. Please. Trying to, yeah. And please, <clears throat> at the five minute mark, tell me. Sure, okay? sure. Because there's a, a lot to get through. Okay, I want to get something out first, and that is um, often a polarizing issue, and I just want to make the observation. If the projected demand that we've seen on the chart is met by a proportional increase in animal numbers, we've got a problem. If the proportional growth in demand has the same level of emissions intensity as today, we've got a problem. Now, that is not a herd reduction strategy I'm advocating for. I'm saying the fewer animals possible to meet the demand is desirable. And that's the approach we're taking in the hub. Um, now, 30 seconds on the hub. We're a philanthropically funded uh, or non-profit organization working to accelerate uh, mitigation of methane from across energy waste and agriculture. And I lead the agriculture program, within which we're working in R&D, measurement, policy, finance, uh, corporate engagement, uh, amongst other things. In that context, um, to get to the question on innovation, we are devoting a lot of energy to complement a broader program with a very concerted effort to develop solutions for the largest single source of anthropogenic methane, that is enteric fermentation from uh, ruminant livestock. The current situation uh, that we observe is that there is, um, first of all, a lack of scale of funding for innovation directed towards that source. There is um, a siloed approach or a fragmented approach in the way the existing funding is deployed into research uh, activities, uh, whether that be public or private. Um, and there's a system or geographic um, uh, bias towards certain systems with some technologies that have received more attention. And what we are trying to do is use our catalytic role with philanthropic funding to address those issues. So first of all, to address the issue of scale, um, what we have announced here is a new um, public good R&D effort that has mobilized uh, in excess of 200 million US dollars towards research to address enteric fermentation. And that comes from philanthropic foundations, from uh, the corporate sector with Danone joining the initiative just before the COP, uh, and uh, some governments in a in a pooled or aligned manner, and those include Ireland, New Zealand, the United States, and, and others, uh, the Canadian uh, announcement around the, the uh, Livestock Methane Challenge. Now, to the, to the question of scope or coverage and the bias, for lack of a better description, we need solutions that address enteric fermentation globally. So while we encourage and will be supporting work on feed additives, we need more. So the scope of R&D that we will be supporting will include feed additives, current and discovery, but also genetics, microbiome, immunology and vaccine, measurement to, to underpin the research strategy, uh, and any and all other promising solutions that have a possibility of being deployed in grazing systems and sheep, cattle, et cetera, around the world, in developing regions as well as developed regions. And then to the, another element of it is the type of funding that it is, is hoping to uh, address some of the weaknesses in the way current funding works. And whether it be public funding or private funding, there are always constraints on you know, how much, where, how, over what time period. And what we are hoping to do is, is kind of be a glue, be a bridge, be a scaler, to address the various challenges that different funding institutions, public, private, face. And given the nature of our funding, we have a lot of flexibility by its, by its nature, uh, as long as the activities we support are in the public good, uh, which is a very important uh, kind of precondition to that work. Um, then to kind of situate that within the first words I said, how am I going? 30 seconds. Okay. 
the important thing about the R&D agenda is it's not in isolation. It's, it's anchored in a broader program that includes the productivity story, includes the policy discussions, it includes finance, innovative financial mechanisms, um, some of which have been um, implemented in, in Uruguay, uh, of course, with World Bank. You know, there's sorts of, how do you bring environmental performance indicators into more traditional uh, operations of multilateral banks, for example? And how can countries benefit from uh, a good environmental performance in the loans that they are receiving from, from institutions? So we want to support all of that ecosystem and have the R&D agenda anchored in that because R&D in the lab, it's got, it doesn't work. It's got to get scaled. And that's where we very much encourage the participation of the, the, the corporate sector supporting the R&D, supporting our broader work programs. Uh, um, uh, and that's it. I'll say no more. Thank you. That's it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much for your um, interventions. And now... It, would like to ask uh, Renata because you are, we have two uh, women on as a panelist. Uh, what's the policies in Brazil implementing uh, to mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emissions? Could you uh, elaborate more on methane framework and also the action that you are taking in in Brazil? Ah, sure. Sure, sure, please, please. Let's change do a little it. bit. Sure, I would like to good. show some images. Ah. Is it ready? Very good. Okay. Just one minute, I want to invest one minute of your life. I will introduce you Samuel Lecato. Do you know Samuel? No? He's from Kenya. You can change the slides, please. I don't know. Ah, here. Samuel Lecato, he's. Family, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, next slide. Her mom, this is the place where he lives. Go ahead, the next slide. This is his livestock, goat, the, where, the place where he lives, go ahead. Uh, the community part of, uh, they are the women who is responsible to bring water from the only place where they have water. They have the capacity of only 500 liters per day. Go ahead, please. Of course, they are happy because they have a lot to celebrate. Go ahead, the next one. I don't know, there are so many. Go ahead. It's more than one minute. Can you? Go to the next slide, to the next video. No, that's okay. I believe so. Okay. Uh, okay, why we are showing this? Because um, Africa is very important when we talk about livestock, when we talk about subsistence uh, and uh, pastoralism, so on. And if we change Samuel's life, Samuel's community life, I think that we have chance to discuss about so many things. Uh, that's the point. Livestock is not the same. We like, we often discuss livestock as it was the same, but after your speech, it was very easy to, to talk about it uh, because it's not the same. And we need to remind it. So before discussing the necessary improvements in livestock, I will answer your question, okay? But everybody here was almost, you know, everybody's hungry, uh, hunger. Let's see. Um, before discussing the necessary improvements in livestock production to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Brazil's commitment to this issue, I would like to highlight three considerations. The first one, we need to discuss the impact of climate change on livestock. The initial focus is often on addressing the environment impact of livestock concerning climate change. However, as we engage in this discussion, the consequences of climate change are already affecting our capa capability to produce food. Unless we act quickly to adapt, there will no one left to worry about climate change because we will be facing hunger and starvation. Can, we cannot think clearly if we are hunger. So therefore, we all need to work hard to reduce fossil fuel emissions, which account to, for over 75 of total emissions. That's the point when we talk about climate change. That is the main point. The second point, 
we should focus on intensity of emission. We all know that global demand for animal products is increasing, so we need to adjust our goals and narratives and start talking about production efficiency, which leads us to climate efficiency. That's the point. We should talk about production efficiency to go to climate efficiency. In livestock farming, we should talk about reducing the intensity of emission per kilogram of meat or liter of milk. Otherwise, we will be supporting a narrative that goes against our need for food production. There is no global, this is the third point, there is no global livestock system. When we talk about livestock, we are talking about one of the ancestral pillars of human development. Firstly, it's extremely heterogeneous and unequal worldwide. Secondly, being ancient, it has deep roots in local cultures, and we need to understand the difficulties of promoting disruptive changes with this audience. I don't know if some of you are producers, are farmers, but they are the hard ones to change. I don't know in your countries, but in Brazil I can say, they are the hard ones. But I love them, don't, 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 don't understand wrongly. <laughs> Having said that, I finally have to say that we have good news. We can make significant transformation with existing technologies. Of course, we, we, we have to invest in innovation. I'm not talking about that we don't need new sprints of innovation. We need, but we already have a lot of technology to put in place. So we don't have to wait for the future, for future innovation. We need, we need to act. We have enough material to act now and make adjustments along the way. So by working with these triple wind technologies capable for minimizing the impact of climate events, increasing productivity, and create new jobs, mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, we can overcome misleading narrative, as my friend Fernando Mato said here. Create a win-win process, including farmers in the process, and bridging between crises, food insecurity and climate insecurity. Develop climate efficiency, working with fewer emissions per capita. Where is my last message? Let me find. It's in somewhere else here. Well, I found. No, that's okay. My last question, my last question. If we have so many technologies, exist technology, why we don't transform everything? Because we need cooperation, you said that. We need science cooperation, we need finance cooperation. And in Brazil, we are prepared to share. We have a lot of things to share, but we need partnerships. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you very much, uh, Renata, for your uh, insights. Uh, information and also before we start this session we also just share the photos that we received from our friends our young producers from Kenya because during the global conference on sustainable livestock transformation we also have the session called global youth dialogue for sustainable livestock transformation but we need to continue to work with our young producers young farmers and also youth and young scientists that it can bring more solution for us and now i would like to give the floor to uh eric we know that uh edf just uh, launched uh, the dairy methane actions alliance what is the expected uh, impact uh, from this engagement Yes, thank you. And I'm Eric Schwab from Environmental Defense Fund. We are a global nonprofit dedicated to climate action. And we work through science, we work in economics with business, all in support of local community action uh, to get to the progress that we are talking about here today. Uh, we've already heard about the important opportunity associated with 
with methane. Um, this has been a focus of EDFs in an oil and gas context for a long time, but we also know already that agricultural methane surpasses oil and gas methane as a global, uh, as a global greenhouse gas um, set of emissions. Um, so we're focused in on this work. I, I want to, before I get immediately to your questions, just emphasize one other thing which has been inherent in some of this conversation already here today, uh, but bears emphasis, and that is that we're really talking about seeking triple win solutions. We're talking about solutions that both reduce these important greenhouse gas emissions, but also protect nutrition and livelihoods in communities around the world. That bears emphasis. Now to um, the Dairy Methane Action Alliance, which we were very excited to be a part of launching here just a couple of days ago. Uh, we worked with six of the world's largest food companies in an historic initiative to drive down dairy methane emissions. So, Bell Group, Danone, General Mills, Kraft Heinz, Lactalis USA, and Nestle, with a combined global sales of more than $200 billion a year, have committed by the end of 2024 to transparently account for and publicly disclose total methane emissions from their dairy supply chains and create and implement a methane action plan to drive down emissions across their respective supply chains. Um, this alliance will accelerate the development of tools and standards for measuring and reporting methane emissions from complex, complex dairy supply chains. So EDF will provide technical assistance and guidance and access to some of the cutting edge research that we have already heard um, discussed here today. And people, again, will be at the center of this effort. Dairy farmers will be the ones on the ground implementing these important solutions. And that leads back to a re-emphasis on these triple win solutions and EDF's dedication to better livelihoods for farmers and their families, enhanced nutrition for the growing population that we've already heard referenced, and lower methane emissions. Uh, we already know that the world has reached a tipping point that requires action now. And this is a place where we can take action now that will have outsized impact, um, as I think evidenced by the amazing turnout in this room here today. And so at EDF, um, we're appreciative to be a part of this effort, and we are calling on other dairy methane companies and cooperatives to join the Dairy Methane Action Alliance, and we're calling on policymakers to make the kinds of investments that are necessary to uh, support this transition to climate smart livestock management. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your interventions. And now I would like to give the floor to Donna Moore. Um, the Global Dairy Platform has engaged with different uh, stakeholders, including International uh, Dairy Federation and also other uh, dairy sectors, uh, working on pathway to Dairy Net Zero initiative to reduce the carbon footprints of dairy sectors. Can you please tell us about the, the contribution of this in initiative uh, to address the climate change in dairy sectors in different countries. Fantastic. Thank you. And how are we doing time-wise, Tanawat? Five. Five minutes? Great. Um, so let me just give you a little bit of context. And I know we're standing between you and lunch probably, but I'm going to throw some numbers at you, and I'm going to test you at the end to see if you've paid attention. So dairy is the world's largest agricultural commodity by value, third largest by volume. There are around 133 million dairy farms in the world. And it needs to be said, and I think one of the other speakers made a comment, there is no one dairy business. There is no one agriculture, no one livestock company. We have farms in the world with 30,000 cows on them. The average farm, though, in the dairy sector worldwide is three cows. So this is an industry with a very long tail of smallholder businesses all over the world. With the dairy sector, we know that we also provide regular 
high quality nutrition to around 6 billion consumers on a regular basis. There are 600 million people living on dairy farms around the world, another 400 million people who derive their livelihood from dairy upstream and downstream from the farm. So this is a billion people industry feeding 6 billion people on a regular basis. We know, we know, we know all the good dairy does. We know what it does from a nutritional perspective. We know what that nutrition does for health. We know what it does from livelihoods. We know what it does for economic growth. We know what it does in terms of reducing hunger. All of these things have been researched by the FAO and have put, they've produced reports on them. So we know all the good we do in the world, but the dairy sector recognizes, like all agricultural commodities, we have an impact on the natural environment in which we operate, and we need to do more in order to reduce that impact. We launched a program called the Pathways to Dairy Net Zero back in 2021. Thank you, Tanawat. You've mentioned it a couple of times today. It was launched by six different organizations, our own Global Dairy Platform being one of them. We are partnered with FAO on this program, and we're also working very closely with the Global Research Alliance on Agricultural Greenhouse Gases as our knowledge partner. In 2019, FAO produced this report. If you haven't seen, I left a couple of copies at the back, but I think they went before we even started talking. Um, this report told us a lot of stuff about the dairy sector. It was about climate change and the global dairy cattle sector. And in there, one of the things it noted was that around 80% of the emissions, 75% of the emissions from dairy globally are coming from emerging markets, with the remaining 25% coming from the more developed markets. In the dairy sector, we recognize in Pathways to Dairy Net Zero that if we're going to tackle the emissions from the dairy sector globally, we have to have solutions that will operate both in emerging, developing markets at the same time as in the more developed markets that we are operating around the world today. So that's a challenge for us. You know, how do we, how do we instigate, how do we encourage, how do we move forward with um, programs in both emerging as well as developed markets? We need to make sure that in doing so, we don't create other problems. So as we work on reducing emissions, we've got to be careful that we don't create problems in nutritional security, livelihoods, and all those other outcomes that I was talking about before. From the GRA, from the early work they did, they said to us, you know what, if you could implement good practice in every dairy system around the world, you would reduce emissions by 40%. Now, there was a lot of focus in Tanawat's presentation on technologies and innovation. We're talking basic practice here. How do we, you know, basic animal husbandry? How do we feed our animals? How do we ensure they have the right water? All of those basic things have a major impact. We know from pilots in East Africa, a 20% reduction is very achievable in a very short time period, 20% in terms of intensity. So basic interventions will re result in about a 40% reduction. There's another 35% that we can access if we're able to implement technologies all over the world, the existing technologies. And Hayden mentioned some of them, whether they're methane inhibitors, whether they're um, biodigesters, etc. But it still leaves us with 25% that we still need to get at. And that's where Hayden's group comes in with some of the work it's doing. In terms of emerging markets, just leave you with last thought in the last minute I've got. We've been working very closely, not just with FAO, but with EFAD, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, and with the Green Climate Fund, and we have a program in place that's looking at 10 countries around the world that between them, yours is different from mine, uh, between them, between them um, account for around 30% of all the dairy emissions. In East Africa, we are already working on a submission about to go to the Green Climate Fund for Tanzania, Rwanda, Kenya, and Uganda for $400 million. We've just started the work in Latin America with FAO again. In Uganda, unfortunately, the ministers, uh, sorry, not Uganda, in Uruguay, unfortunately, the ministers left. Uruguay, Costa Rica, and Colombia. And in February, we'll be kicking off in Pakistan. And with that, I'm at like Thank you. five minutes now. Oh, wow. You are even the precise more. True, I saw it. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and also now I give the floor to uh, Julia. Could you Thanks. please tell us about the actions uh, the red meat industry is taking to reduce uh, the carbon footprints, especially from your experience in Australia? Please. Sure, and I won't get the alarm bell. I'm going to be quick. Um, uh, many people don't know the Australian red meat sector has a net zero greenhouse gas target for 2030 for the beef, lamb and goat sector. But what surprises people even more is that our latest figures for progress are showing that we've reduced net emissions by just over 64%. 
And that surprises people because they think, well, what's Australia got that we don't? They've got the secret source. What's, where's that all coming from? So what we have is we have land. So 50% of Australia's land mass is under grazing management in Australia. So that's a huge opportunity to sequester carbon in our vegetation and soils uh, under, under grazing management. So that's where the majority of that 64% progress has come from, uh, regrowth vegetation and avoided clearing. Our enteric methane emissions, however, since 2005, have stayed relatively flat. So we recognise that that falls short of delivering on a long-term um, climate mitigation and it falls short of what the supply chain expects of industry as well. So what have we got on the table as an industry? Um, Australian farmers are some of the most efficient in the world, but modelling suggests that, uh, particularly in our more extensive savannah-style landscapes, that small improvements in animal husbandry, reproductive success could deliver a 15% reduction in our national uh, livestock methane. So that's, that's a real one to focus on that we don't need any silver bullets to, to start working on. Um, but if we're going to be a viable source of nutrition uh, that supports livelihoods, we're going to need more tools in our toolkit and that's where Meat and Livestock Australia comes in. So as a service provider of R&D and marketing to the red meat sector, we've co-invested $140 million into this CN30 portfolio. So as, as Hayden mentioned, uh, not entirely focused on additives, we're interested in animal genetics, uh, which can deliver a 1% compounding uh, reduction in methane over time. We're looking at common pastures, what properties might they have to reduce methane? Um, but additives are a significant part of that portfolio. 15 years ago, we didn't know that we could uh, you know, deliver a asparagopsis or deliver a bovair 10 uh, to reduce methane in the rumen. Uh, five years ago, uh, we've learnt that we can actually achieve a 90% reduction in methane in controlled environments like feedlots. But the real challenge now, and this is our new frontier, is how do we get those solutions out into the grazing sector? Where in Australia, 95% of sheep and beef are, are raised on pasture. So we're looking at water troughs, slick blocks, uh, a bolus, an implant, all sorts of things are on the table. Uh, and, and that's sort of the real focus for our investment now. Um, we share a lot of uh, common challenges with the dairy sector, but some of Australia's harsh landscapes share a lot in common with other livestock regions like South America and like in Africa. So we're quite excited that we um, are making these investments. We feel we'll have a lot of knowledge to share, but also a lot to learn from other regions uh, as they progress towards sustainable livestock. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for sharing uh, experience from Australia and also I would like to take this opportunity to thank all panelists and also speakers who are sharing their experience and also their commitment, what they are doing. But anyway, we know that we don't have only single solution to make change or to do things better. But we need your corrective efforts and actions from all of you who are representing consumers farmers, producers, private sectors, and also government. And that's why all of us have a duty. All of us need to take action. And the action, if you want to see a better planet tomorrow, we need to take an action now. If we want to see a better livestock sectors that make contribution to healthy people and healthy planet, we also need to join our effort. And please do it now and take more action together. Thank you very much for joining us and also have a good lunch and also I'm sure that don't forget to balance about your balanced healthy diets. Thank you very much. Okay, and I, I think it's my colleagues also would like to have a group photos uh, of our speakers and also audience if you would like to join us, please feel free. Thank you. And also if you want to have any further question, please uh, join our conversation outside. Thank you.